live from Lynn University in Boca Raton, ahead of the final presidential debate tonight, often lost in the back and forth over the deadly attack in Libya, is the United States' decision last year to help the rebels overthrow the former Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. A number of analysts have now suggested that the U.S.-led airstrikes helped create the instability that is plaguing Libya now. And joining us is our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, I remember this time last year on this program, we called Libya the not war, because it right. kind of was the war that was not a war, that we weren't, not, weren't going to do anything, that war. And then every day it seemed there was a little bit more going on in the not war. And finally, it was actually a war, and we were actually doing things. And now it appears it's biting them on the butt. It sure is, Chap. And you may recall that the uh, president announced while the Congress was on spring break that he had decided to participate in the bombing of Libya and, quote, there wouldn't be any boots on the ground. I guess by boots on the ground, he meant there wouldn't be any active duty military on the ground. Right. There were military in the skies and the planes that were bombing, and there were intelligence officers on the ground guiding the pilots in the skies as to where to bomb. Bottom line is, as a result of that bombing, we, the United States of America, without a declaration of war by the Congress, in an effort to join the European uh, elites, and, and the militias that were trying to get rid of the monster Gaddafi not only destroyed him, destroyed his government, destroyed his military, destroyed the national police, destroyed the national intelligence forces, destroyed the local police, as well as infrastructure. Is it any wonder, some of us have argued, Shep, that the so-called rule of law in Libya is now the rule of roving gangs of militias, at least one of which killed our ambassador and his likely intelligence agency colleagues. This sounds like the blame America sort of policy that, that uh, I don't know, that you don't normally want hung on your own neck. Well, this is a blame the Obama administration for well, that, that's, that's America. Well, th mean, that's that's the president of the United States making a decision that's not in the best interest of the United States or not in the best interest of peace in the long-term peace in the Middle East because he was warned by the same intelligence agencies whose warnings he, he's looking the other way from now, that the people who would take over from Colonel Gaddafi were some of the same people that we had been fighting against in Afghanistan and Iraq. And sure enough, one of the first things they did after Gaddafi was killed was to open up the jails. And who came out? Some people that had formerly been incarcerated by us in Guantanamo Bay. So this is a mess that the president has created that, unfortunately for him, two weeks from Election Day seems to be getting worse the more we learn about it. Mm -hmm. An interesting take on that, Judge Napolitano. Thanks. We'd like your feedback on that. If you like, go to one of our feedback forums. We'd like to hear from you. Hey, the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi took a, uh, took a smaller role at last night's debate than analysts expected, especially everyone here on the couch. And nevertheless, President Obama took the opportunity to defend his administration's overall policy on Libya with this. I and Americans took leadership in organizing an international coalition that made sure that we were able to, without putting troops on the ground, at the cost of less than what we spent in two weeks in Iraq, liberate a country that had been under the yoke of dictatorship for 40 years. All right, Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano has written a column about the president's handling of this. He joins us live. Good morning to you. Good morning. It's nice to be the tween on this couch. <laughs> <laughs> now, Judge, you, you, so you've written this column. You've also looked at the cables, and so uh, you are able to actually separate fact from perhaps a fairy tale. The cables that I saw came from members of the intelligence community on the ground in Libya, and they were sent on September 12th, the, the, the day after... Uh, the murder of the ambassador uh, and his colleagues. Mm. And they set forth clearly and unambiguously the role of al-Qaeda uh, in this invasion. The day after. The day after. That's four days before U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice was dispatched by the White House right. to uh, five television networks on a Sunday morning to create the false impression that this was a spontaneous political demonstration, a cultural aversion, to a 15-minute piece of garbage film that somebody from uh, California made. It is inconceivable that the cables that I saw, the White House did not see. So therefore, it is easy to conclude that the White House intentionally deceived the American people about what happened because the president created this mess himself. Gaddafi was a monster, no question about it. 
But in ridding the country of Gaddafi, the president destroyed any opportunity for the Libyans to govern. So who or what is governing Libya? Roving gangs mm -hmm. of militia. Whoever controls a neighborhood governs that neighborhood. One of those gangs, propelled by al-Qaeda, attacked our embassy. Yeah, but the some, conclusion is inescapable. Some Republicans were in agreement with going into Libya in the way in which the president yes, did. Senator yes, John McCain, yes, for they, Yes, they were. It would have been far better if the Congress had declared war on Libya and we had done it lawfully. When the president says there are no boots on the ground, he is technically correct. But there were guys on the ground not wearing boots. They were intelligence agents, and they were special ops. They were not a uniformed military. The president didn't seek the consent of the Congress when he did this. He did it on his own. He destroyed the Libyan government. He destroyed the Libyan military. He destroyed their intelligence community. He destroyed their national police, their equivalent to the FBI, and he destroyed their local police. Mm -hmm. And the government that replaced Gaddafi is incapable of governing, mm -hmm. and we suffered because of it. So all that was out there, it's just so interesting, that, and... And Governor Romney, no one doubts his intelligence and ability uh, to understand this stuff. He decided for another day. I'm not going there. I'm going to leave that to McCain and, and need, Graham. Needless to say, I was disappointed that uh, Governor Romney chose to take a step back from this. But I think I understand his strategy. His strategy was to be presidential. And to me, last night, by not taking the debate, by, by responding only once, to sort of the petty sniping by the president. And there was a lot. Correct. Governor Romney did seem presidential, and the president seemed petty right. and, and nervous. And no one's talking about a gaffe today. And no. that was important for the Romney camp. No. So I think Dick Morris, God bless him, makes a good point. In the end, Governor Romney seemed far more presidential than the current occupant of the White House. All right. Let's see if it changes the momentum at Two all. Two weeks to go. It right. is. All right. Judge, thank you very much. Pleasure, guys. All right. There has been an awful lot of criticism over the Obama administration's handling of the situation in Libya, from the apparent lapses in security before the terror attack on our U.S. consulate in Benghazi to the changing narrative after the attack that left our ambassador and three other Americans dead. Here's how Governor Romney addressed it last night. We've seen in nation after nation a number of disturbing events. Of course, we see in Syria 30,000 civilians having been killed by the military there. Uh, we see in, in, uh, uh, in Libya uh, an attack uh, apparently by, well, I think we know now, by terrorists of some kind against, uh, against our people there, four people dead. And Mr. Romney pretty much left it at that, leaving some to say he missed an opportunity. Joining us now, Judge Andrew Napolitano, a Fox News senior judicial analyst. You have some thoughts about the Libya situation. You say that the president destroyed the Libyan government? Well, the president, uh, President Obama, destroyed the Libyan government when he unilaterally bombed Libya last year, John, while the Congress of the United States was on spring break. He made the announcement while he was in Brazil and said he didn't have time to get Congress's approval or authorization as the Constitution required. Of course, he did have time to get approval from NATO and from the Arab League, mysteriously, however, not from Congress. But in bombing the way he did, he destroyed not only Gaddafi personally and Gaddafi's government, but he also destroyed government material, government buildings, government personnel, police stations, the intelligence community, and, and by, by creating this vacuum in the government, once Gaddafi was dead, he opened up room for the gangs uh, of militias that now rule the country to come in. And one of the first things those gangs did was to open up the jails. And out of the jails came some of the very people that Gaddafi had locked up who were members of al-Qaeda. In the case of a few of them, they had been released from Guantanamo Bay because the U.S. military had captured them. But so he, he is largely, in my view, responsible for having created the environment in which Ambassador Stevens and others were murdered. He is the commander in chief, and does the War Powers Act not give him the opportunity, the, the right to use military force where he deems it appropriate? It does. But to have suggested that he had time to consult and get the approval of the Arab League and NATO and not the approval of the United States Congress is an insult to Congress, an insult to the American people, and an insult to the Constitution. And it shows a, a, a rush to please the European mentality. Gaddafi's bad and he's got to go without thinking about the likely consequences of such an invasion. And those consequences, unfortunately, were manifested on September 11th when the ambassador was murdered. And then to dispatch UN Ambassador Rice to lie about it 
And to do this at the height of a presidential campaign is chutzpah that Governor Romney should have challenged last night. Judge Andrew Napolitano, our senior judicial analyst. Judge, thank you. Pleasure, John. Meanwhile, this just in, those controversial airport body scanners are on their way out. The TSA now swapping those machines, showing you in your birthday suit, for ones that don't take such graphic pictures, not as much of you in your birthday suit. I hate to say this, but I told you so. I know the maker of these machines said, well, you got, they're not going to record anything. But there is going to be an image, and there is going to be a saved image. <laughs> this is what I wear underneath my outfit, just so you guys know. That? The rebel, was... Neil. Um, <laughs> Bottom line, our bottoms are on line, my friends. The TSA really is into TNA, and I told you it would happen. Well, I warned them. The judge says, uh, look what happened now. Uh, the judge also warning about these things. I guess the question now, Judge, what do they go to instead? Well, they haven't told us, but my guess is they're going to go to either a, a dialed back version of this, which won't reveal as much graphic information about our bodily parts as these ones do, or to the old metal magnetometers, which really show them what they need to see, which is metal. Look, I'm not in favor of the magnetometers. In my view, all of this is unconstitutional and unlawful. The Fourth Amendment actually absolutely prohibits it, and it is insane for the government to assume the responsibility for safety in the air. Safety in the air. But I mean, you also have to balance that with safety then, right? To that point, I mean, which wins out? Live I mean, would you live with this if it means um, that the alternative is the plane isn't blowing up with someone sneaking. Well, stuff. That, that's not the alternative. The alternative is the airlines, which have the most to gain and the most to lose, maintain their own, uh, their own security. The government security personnel, as we know from Newark Airport, out of which you and I fly all the time, is reprehensible. When you but I mean, look at these images that they have. I don't know how useful these images can be, because I don't know if that's a human being or an alien. Um, so I don't know how helpful it is. That, but, that, but Okay, that is a photograph of an image. If you were actually looking at the images, I've seen these up close, really? you would see a great deal more I'm without getting leave blurry, it at that, Judge. a great deal but, more detail than we see. All right, but they have to find out something. See, they can even digitize it for all us, which they I have, think is good. Pixelate, you know, by, the by their own statute, put aside whether the statute is constitutional, but by their own statute, all they have to find is an instrument that can harm someone else. They don't need to see body shapes. They don't need to see pornographic images. They only need to know if you have explosive or if you have metal on it. Now, when you approach the government and you go like this, is this the position of a free person who raises his hands in command to the government? Not in the America you and I were born and raised. So when you in. go in one of those machines, do you give them this? And the, well, you just get in there. Well, you know, I, I don't want to explain on television the run-ins that I've had. With I them. bet you. But are. let's say I do a lot of flying, and they're familiar with my opinions of their work and the constitutionality of their organization. Some of them I agree with I.e., the judge my, goes by private jet. Some of them uh, agree with my opinions, and some of them don't. Uh, well, it's 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 their. It's their hassle if they do, because you would be the most hellish person to come across that line. Uh, judge. As far as I know, they don't have any pornographic pictures of me. Not a pretty thought. <laughs> well, you know, they do with me. Uh, I don't know. Some of these are not threatening to me. It just seems like a bad sci-fi movie, but not just me. But this is completely false. The attack in Benghazi was clearly an act of terrorism, which is why the president referred to it as such three times before this testimony. And a spokesman for the NCTC said Olson denied he had ever been reprimanded for those statements, Shep. Catherine Herridge, live in Washington. Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. Let's take this to the judge now. Our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is in studio with, studio with us. Well, I mean, hundreds of people had these emails just in the, I mean, in the hours after the attack, not days or weeks, but hours. You know, we now know why the president uh, didn't want to address this the other night at the uh, final debate and probably well, breathed a sigh of relief. Mitt Romney didn't seem to want to either. Correct. Whatever the president said, Mitt Romney agreed Correct. with it. Correct. The, the, the governor missed a golden opportunity to rip into the president on this, and the president dodged the bullet. Now, we don't know what they knew. Governor Romney also gets intelligence briefings, as does the president. We don't know if it's the same level as that 
mm. which the president gets. But we now know that the president could not have been truthful when he told John Stewart on The Daily Show on Comedy Central, as soon as we get this information, we release it to the American people. We also know that Ambassador Rice was not being truthful when she said to Chris Wallace and others four days after the Do we the know attack, she wasn't being truthful? Or do we know, I don't know. Do we know if she had the information? It's hard to believe she didn't. But I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't somebody mean to correct, somebody just, between the White House and Ambassador Rice was not being truthful. Somebody somewhere. Because we now know that 400 people in the State Department, in the intelligence community, in the Situation Room, and in the White House knew that this was a terrorist attack. I think it's political, Shep, and I think it's going to come back to hurt the president. The president has argued that because he killed Osama bin Laden, Al Qaeda and the monsters are on the run. They're not on the run. And for them to admit that their statement, their political statement was wrong, they'd have to tell the truth as to what happened in Benghazi, and that will hurt them. Okay. It, it, on the surface of things, that's how things look to a lot of people. Right. But if you back this up and you say, all right, what, what we're trying to say here, or, or the implication is, that the White House knew this was a terrorist attack, that Susan Rice was sent out to say that it wasn't, when they knew 400 people had these emails, if they were intentionally telling the truth, surely they knew it would come out, and surely they knew if they did that, it would hurt them before this election. That, there was a month plus to go. That, it's a great question, Shep. That is a head scratcher here. The president knew at the time he was in a close race, unless his polls told, tell him he was running away with it, and he could. He but could it's never the it crime, it's the cover up. This is. Correct. Correct. Look, it is not against the law for the government to lie to the people. True. But the remedy is a political one. And the people once lied to may take that remedy and vote out of office a government that they believe has lied to them. Okay, let, let's say they did it another way. He has, he has a, a huge lead at the time, which is highly unusual for Democrats, on, on national security right. and on military matters. Now, let's say they did it this way. Everybody knew. They came right out and said, America has been attacked. We go on the offensive now. The, the White House says, we will get them. They have attacked us on this day. If you're thinking just politically, which is apparently what everybody is doing on this, doesn't this give you a huge political bone? When the United States is attacked traditionally without failure and without, without any wavering, the people come together around the people who are now in power. So Correct. if this is the case, why wouldn't they go, People, we've been attacked again. Come together. Let's stay together. Let's fight the terrorists. Uh, that seems like the politically better it's a, move. It's another head scratcher. The, the president must know some things. And Secretary Clinton, who said, either don't that or this was one emails. of those unforced kinds of errors that this White House says we don't make. Somebody made a mistake, yeah. and the White House thought that they could get away with it, and somebody in the White House thought they could cover it up, and now it's all going to come down on them at the worst possible time for the president, 13 days before election day. It's hard, it's hard to figure out exactly. It is, but it's a serious issue oh, yeah. that a lot of people are rightly concerned right. with and nope. unhappy about. Absolutely. Judge, very weird. Thank Ple you. Pleasure, Chef. All right. From the very beginning, the Obama administration would not call the attacks in Benghazi what they were, which is terrorism. Based on the information that we, our initial information, and that includes all information, uh, we saw no evidence to back up claims by others that uh, this was a pre-planned or premeditated attack. But brand new emails uncovered by Fox News reveal that senior officials knew within hours the attack had ties to terror. So are there legal ramifications for apparently trying to cover it up. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is here to discuss. Good morning to you, Good Judge. Good morning, Gretchen. All right, since you're the lawyer and the judge, legal ramifications? Well, unfortunately, no. I mean, the Supreme Court has written, these, these are difficult cases to read, that the government can lie and cheat and conceal the truth. And the remedy when the government does this is not a legal action against the government, it's to vote the government out of office. So Jay Carney, who we just saw, who a lot of us know and who's a nice guy, either was materially misleading the people to whom he was speaking in the White House press room or was kept in the dark by those in the White House who knew about it. The fact that the White House and the State Department and major intelligence agencies knew within moments of the start of this attack that it was not a spontaneous reaction by ordinary Libyans to some homemade movie uh, in California, but rather was an organized terrorist assault aimed at our personnel and our property is indisputable. We now know from the emails that our, our colleagues at Fox got that 400 people, senior people, in the White House, the State Department, and the intelligence community were emailing about this as it was happening. So either they didn't tell Jay Carney, they didn't tell Susan Rice, who told Chris Wallace and others that this was a spontaneous demonstration about a, about a crazy, uh, cheap movie. 
or they were lying, or they were told to lie. So is there a, is there a difference between that and maybe spinning a story when you're trying to keep the interests of the United States safe? I mean, I'm thinking about all these other possible covert actions that may be going around, around the world from time to time where the government doesn't tell the public the truth. Understood. Is that different? Understood. I don't think the government can have it both ways. I mean, uh, the president stated... Uh, I think to John Stewart on, on The Daily Show on Comedy Central, oh no, we get this information out and we will get it out as soon as we have it. And there was an outtake on the 60 Minutes interview, you know, something he said to the reporter in front of the camera that I don't think they aired, in which he uh, alluded to the fact that this might be, uh, might be terrorist. I think the president knew what was happening. I think Susan Rice knew what happened. But I think if they said this was al-Qaeda or an organized terrorist assault or done by a, a militia roving in, in the streets that hates the West, that would be inconsistent with the message of the president's campaign, which is he killed bin Laden, al-Qaeda is on the run, therefore reelect him. Let's move on to another topic because a lot of people will have some questions about this. The Fort Hood shooting never labeled a terrorist attack. It right. was a workplace violence shooting incident, according to the government. Right. But now you have this Chick-fil-A shooter who walks into an office in Washington, D.C., and they're labeling that yeah. a terror attack. Why the difference? Well, I, I don't know why they've done this. And this, this labeling is frequently done in a non-legal context. By that, I mean... The courts really don't care what label the government puts on a crime. The courts care what's the charge, does the, evidence, does the government have enough evidence to prove the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. In the case of the Fort, case of the Fort Hood shooter, A, the evidence of guilt is overwhelming. B, he's already uh, uh, exposed to the death penalty, so adding a label to his crime or, or his alleged crime would not increase the penalty or change well, the prosecution. Well, for him, but we've done interviews showing that the victims in the Fort Hood shooting they get different that's, compensation. That is a pensions. very good point. They don't get Purple Hearts. That's a very good point, and that's something that the president himself could change by a phone call to uh, Attorney General Holder. Where's he been lately? <laughs> <laughs> we used to, if there was a time There's we were, talking, topic about, today, we were talking about him all the time. Uh, that could be done by a phone call uh, from the president or from the attorney general. All right. Sorry, I couldn't resist uh, get, that. Get back to me on where he's been. Okay. Maybe we'll do a segment on it tomorrow. Attorney General Holder, where are you? <laughs> he probably likes not being in the limelight right now. Certainly in election right. season. Ooh, Judge, I wonder if that's a coincidence. Maybe, maybe. Good to see you. Have a great okay. day.